A tragedy downtown at Bloor and Avenue Road, where a cyclist has died after being struck by a dump truck. Good afternoon. The accident happened just before 9 this morning. The victim is a woman. The driver of the truck remained on the scene. CTV's John Musselman is at the scene this hour and joins us live with the latest. John. Well, not Leon, I'm standing on the uh, north side of the Bloor Street sidewalk. In behind me is the truck and the bike involved here. This was a, a bike rental, the uh, rental bikes that you see across the city. Uh, this happened just around 840 this morning. We'll show you some video now. Uh, the area is Avenue Road and Bloor Street West, according to uh, police and investigators. The cyclist was heading eastbound in the bike lane and appeared to be approaching what looked like a garbage bin placed in that bike lane. And at one point, the cyclist seems to have exited the bike lane and was struck by this pickup truck. Now, we've talked to a lot of people here uh, expressing concerns about uh, the conditions on Avenue Road and Bloor Street. Here's what one cyclist had to tell us just a short time ago. I'm just feeling for whoever that is and their family and it could have been any one of us. Um, and I guess it's a nod at like, what can we do to like better the bike lanes, like to make it safer. Like we're spending so much money on like making it safer, but clearly, you know, we're on like Bluer. This is one of those beautiful bike lanes in the city and something's wrong. This is also one of the busiest intersections in the city as well. Pedestrians, cyclists, and traffic. Now, police have still sealed off the roadway here as they continue this investigation. We did get an update from police on scene here. Here's what they had to tell us just a short time ago. That bicycle exited the bike lane and continued traveling westbound. At that same time, a dump truck was also traveling westbound, struck that cyclist, and they were pronounced deceased at the scene. The, to the driver of the dump truck remained on scene and is cooperating with police. This is obviously a very tragic incident. Now, we don't know the age of this cyclist. We do know it was a woman, and this happened again around 8.40 this morning. Uh, police are canvassing the area businesses for any type of surveillance video that might help explain exactly how this happened. We're told that the truck driver did remain on the scene and is cooperating with police. Reporting live at the scene, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. Okay, thank you, John. Meanwhile, at City Hall, Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow wants to curb the kind of flooding that hit the city last week. Chow says big commercial property owners will have to pay if they don't take action to reduce storm water runoff. CTV Siobhan Morris is covering council today and has the details. Siobhan. Well, we heard from the mayor an acknowledgement that the heavy kind of rain we saw last week and the flooding that came with it is only going to happen more and more often. And so Toronto needs to find ways to keep the streets from becoming more like lakes. She's asking the city manager to come back with a report later this year that's evaluating the existing flood mitigation measures on the books right now and some that have been discontinued, all with the aim of, again, reducing flooding, helping out homeowners where possible. But she did say that there should be a focus on those business owners. Here's more of what the mayor had to say. We're not talking about residential. We're talking about commercial. Is that if you provide your service, make it more permeable, then you don't pay, pay, you pay less, right? Whereas if you do nothing and your parking lot become parking lake, then you should take some responsibility. What are those responsibility? Is it a charge? We uh, and and if you want to do something, what percentage? You know, all of that will be. Con there's consultation that will start in August, and this kind of consultation from August, September, October. Hopefully, there will be a package coming back before the end of the year that would answer the question that I just asked. The mayor says there should also be consultations for homeowners about what kind of measures would be most helpful to them to keep their basements from filling up with water. Again, she's hoping to get a staff report back from city staff by the end of the year. Reporting live from City Hall, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Still to come, the Science Centre may have been closed suddenly due to concerns about a possible roof collapse, but that didn't stop a wedding from happening a day later. CTV John Woodward will have the CTV News exclusive. But first, let's take a look at the forecast. Here's a live shot outside. Mainly clear skies, just a few clouds, a light breeze, but a nice-looking day overall. No rain expected for the next few days, so you might have to water the grass. But overall, a great day to be outside. Also, the air quality is good. 
As for the current conditions, let's take a look at our satellite radar, and you'll see there's really nothing much going on. To the east, a bit of rain, and to the south, but as far as the GTHA, nothing to be concerned about there. Right now, we're sitting at 22 degrees in Oshawa, 21 in Hamilton, 21 in St. Catharines. With the humidex, it does feel a little bit warmer, but it's not too bad. As for current conditions at the island, 24 degrees, feeling like 26, and at Pearson Airport, 23, feeling like 26, pretty much seasonal. We'll give you a look at the long-range forecast a little bit later on in the show. The battle against two raging wildfires in Jasper, Alberta, has taken a turn for the worse. The larger of the two fires has reached the town faster than expected. Due to the burning conditions, the heavy smoke, and the aggressive fire behavior yesterday, it was not safe for the firefighters or aircraft to get to those structures. This was the terrible scene just outside the gates of Jasper National Park last night. The air quality has deteriorated so much that the town of Hinton had to be evacuated. Parks Canada says a number of buildings in Jasper have already been damaged, adding that significant loss has occurred within the town site. We do know the wildfire has reached the grounds of the historic Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge. We don't know the full extent of the damage, but the lodge confirms all employees and guests were able to leave safely. Another iconic resort, however, has been destroyed. This is what the Moline Lodge looked like late last night. The owners have confirmed the loss. Also to the emergency responders and firefighters, we're, we, we wish you all the luck in, in fighting this fire and keeping safe as well. And we're going to do everything we can to put this fire out. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith sharing a message on social media thanking fire crews for all their hard work. She says safety is the top priority and was grateful the town was evacuated earlier this week. Ontario is offering assistance to Alberta during its time of need. Premier Ford wrote on X today, Along with the people of Ontario, I'm devastated to see the terrible impacts of the wildfires in Jasper. Ontario stands with our friends in Alberta, and we are sending anyone and anything we can to help, including firefighting crews, helicopters, and all the equipment we can spare. Ontario will be there with Alberta as you re rebuild. Loblaw and its parent company have agreed to pay $500 million to settle a pair of class action lawsuits. The settlement relates to the involvement of Loblaw and George Weston Limited in an alleged bread price fixing scheme. The cases were filed on behalf of all residents of Canada who purchased packaged bread after November 1, 2001. The class action suit accuses the companies of participating in a 14-year industry-wide price fixing conspiracy resulting in an artificial increase in prices. Loblaw and George Weston Chairman Galen Weston apologized and said this behavior should never have happened. Lawyers representing the plaintiff said the payout is the largest antitrust settlement in Canadian history. But there's more work to do. This massive settlement, which by the way is just going to be the first installment, uh, we will recover a lot more money. But, you know, you engage in this kind of conduct and, you know, we'll be coming after you too. That's just the way it is. The payout is subject to court approval. The lawyers will now focus on preparing for trial in ongoing class actions against Canada Bread, Sobeys, Metro, Walmart, Canada, and Giant Tiger. And in Toronto this morning, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said the collusion was allowed to happen because there was no law against it at the time, and he's calling for change. It is ridiculous that people, that citizens, had to fight in court to get justice. That is not the way things should work. The rules should be there to protect Canadians. But the rules written by Liberals and Conservatives, by Justin Trudeau and Pierre Polyev, have allowed big corporations to rip you off. And there is no real penalties. We want to change that. We want severe sanctions, severe penalties. Now to the sentencing hearing for Peter Nygaard at the University Avenue Courts. It is day two of the trial and we are hearing from victims. CTV Scott Lightfoot joins us now live with the latest from the courthouse. Scott. Yeah. Natalie, this is the sentencing hearing, day two, as you mentioned. We're hearing from Nygaard's lawyer, who actually began her submissions yesterday. This morning, she made the case that Nygaard should receive a sentence of six years, but with time served, she's asking for just under two years behind bars. She's talked at length over the past day and a half about his age, health, factors that should be considered in making the sentence. Now, the Crown asked for a sentence of 15 years behind bars yesterday. One of the issues here is that the 83-year-old is at little risk of ever reoffending or of ever being rehabilitated at that age. He was found guilty on four counts of sexual assault by a jury last fall. But once he finishes his legal issues here, he is still facing trials in Quebec, Manitoba, and the U.S. Yesterday, the judge heard victim impact statements from three of the victims, all of whom talked about how these assaults have damaged their lives and their mental health. 
I can also tell you that uh, Nygaard's lawyer has spent a significant amount of time talking about the conditions in which the former fashion mogul has been living at the Toronto South Detention Centre. They have not been favourable comments. Uh, he has a number of issues, including some with his eyesight. There are issues with the lighting, with access to washroom facilities. She did tell the court that he has his own private cell, which keeps him away from other inmates. He has a specialized bed, and he has access to a telephone through which he can contact his assistant. But those factors are sort of used as reasons why he should not be kept in jail for longer than necessary, given his advanced age. However, I can tell you at the end of her submissions today, she actually asked the judge to keep him at the Toronto South Detention Facility for the length of whatever sentence the judge decides. Instead of moving him to federal penitentiary, the hearing is ongoing. It's expected to continue throughout the afternoon. Morning live outside 361 University. I'm Scott Lightfoot. Now back to you. All right. Thank you, Scott. Toronto police have identified a suspect in more than a dozen separate thefts in the heart of downtown. Between June 20th and July 19th, police say this man repeatedly targeted three retailers near Young and Dundas. It's alleged 22-year-old Moye Alzgul of Toronto carried out 13 thefts during that time, making off with goods worth around $25,000. If you have any information on his whereabouts, Toronto police would like to hear from you, or you can share tips anonymously with Crime Stoppers. Now to a solemn speech last night by U.S. President Joe Biden. Biden explained his reasons for dropping his bid for re-election and issued an urgent call to his fellow Americans, warning them that the country's democracy is at stake. I've made it clear that I believe America is at an inflection point. One of those rare moments in history when the decisions we make now will determine our fate of our nation and the world for decades to come. America's going to have to choose between moving forward or backward, between hope and hate, between unity and division. We have to decide, do we still believe in honesty, decency, respect, freedom, justice, and democracy? And CTV Scott Hurst joins us now live with the latest on this. Scott, why did Joe Biden say that he was stepping aside here, and what has the reaction been? Natalie, it was a speech that lasted just about 10 or 11 minutes, but the U.S. president covered a lot of ground. Of course, this is a speech he ultimately did not want to have to make, but over the last couple of weeks, he ended up bowing to that chorus of people that's saying he should step aside and step out of the race for re-election. And so after that bombshell announcement on Sunday that he is, in fact, stepping away from his re-election bid, he is changing his tune, albeit reluctantly agreeing to that it's time to pass the torch, saying nothing can come in the way of saving democracy, not, a, not even personal ambition. And that ambition, of course, is his bid for a second term. Going on to say it's time for a new generation, new voices, fresh voices, and younger voices, of course, referring to his vice president, Kamala Harris, who he has tapped as his successor to become the presumptive Democratic nominee. Now, we've also heard from Republicans and Donald Trump not only trashing the speech, but also really sharpening their attacks against Kamala Harris. Here's more from Donald Trump at a rally last night, giving us a glimpse of what to expect over the last 100 days until Americans go to the polls. I was supposed to be nice. They say... Something happened to me when I got shot. I became nice. <laughs> and when you're dealing with these people, they're very dangerous people. When you're dealing with them, you can't be too nice. You really can't be. So if you don't mind, I'm not going to be nice. Is that OK? And Natalie, one more thing to mention. The White House is still insisting that Biden's reasoning to step aside has nothing to do with his health. And it is not health related as the reason why he's bowing out of the race. Okay, so in that case then, Scott, what are Biden's next steps? Will he play a role in, in the Harris campaign? Well, first and foremost, he has about six months left of his term, still six months as U.S. president, brushing off Republican calls to not only step out of the race for re-election, but step down from his role as president right now. And he laid out an ambitious six months ahead, including protecting the right to choose, referencing the ongoing battle over abortion, talking about defending NATO, and calling for Supreme Court reform. And he praised Kamala Harris as tough and capable and according to his staff he will play a role in her re-election campaign he will take part in rallies and fundraisers but Natalie the big question now is how much will the Kamala Harris campaign want him to be involved pitching her as the next president or do they want her to really carve out her own path out of the shadow as being his vice president so we'll have to wait and see over the next couple months ahead
Okay, CTV Scott Hurst with the latest on the presidential race. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Natalie. Well, we are learning more about the shutdown of the Ontario Science Centre. The day after it was closed suddenly in June on public safety grounds, it was reopened to host a wedding. As CTV's John Woodward reports, the happy couples say what staff told them about the building was very different from what was being said publicly. James Hewson and his wife Sarah loved the Ontario Science Centre so much they decided to get married there. It was an incredible night. The big day, Saturday, June 22nd, one day after the centre was shut down in a hurry, the government pointing to failing roof panels as a danger to guests. Not what the Science Centre told the Hewsons. They said, don't really listen to what you're hearing on the news. Like, the building is safe for your guests. You know, like, the only danger is if there's snow. But it's the message that the building is unsafe and beyond repair the provincial government has repeated, pointing to two engineering reports. Critics, including the firm that designed the building, say those reports just indicate the building is showing its age and needs some maintenance. Deputy Premier Sylvia Jones stuck to that line when asked at a press conference Wednesday. It would not be appropriate for us to ignore some very clear uh, engineering advice that suggested structurally the building was unsound. Next question, please. Even Next though question. the building did quite well on Next the rains question. last week. The government is searching for an interim location before a new science centre opens at Ontario Place in 2029, as well as a home for the manufacture of exhibits the science centre has leased to other facilities all over the world. Still a bargain. Elsa Lam of Canadian Architect magazine says government documents estimate just the interim exhibit space alone could cost between 35 and $58 million. Meanwhile, the first engineering report estimated fixing the roof would take around $24 million over 10 years. They made Ontario Place look as you know, inexpensive as possible, and they made the repairs to the Ontario Science Centre look as expensive as possible. The numbers gain perhaps secondary compared to Premier Doug Ford's assertion Monday that the current location was in a a sleepy neighborhood compared to a brand new building on the waterfront. One of the staffers told me that it was somebody from up a uh, high above in government made sure that our wedding went ahead. And I don't know who that could have been, but uh, I can't help but thank them for <laughs> you know, make, uh, helping us for our wedding go ahead. As amazing as it was to have the wedding there, Houston says he would give it up if the building could stay open. John Woodward, CTV News. Ontario Science Centre management said it made an exception for the wedding, which didn't conflict with any immediate safety measures. The search for answers continues after a deadly head-on crash on the 401 back in April. An update from Durham Police is shedding more light on what happened prior to the crash. The new information came during a Durham Police Board meeting on the status of current SIU investigations. It confirms an off-duty officer tried to intervene in a robbery at an LCBO in Bowmanville when the suspect pulled a knife and fled in a U-Haul van. The update also says officers lost sight of the U-Haul for a brief time before the suspect vehicle struck a cruiser and entered the 401 heading the wrong way. Officers pursued the suspect onto the highway, also going in the opposite direction, and minutes later, the suspect and three others were killed in the fiery collision. Provincial police say four vehicles were hit when a wheel went flying off a car on the highway outside Barrie. OPP share these images from this morning in the area of Highway 400 and Highway 88 in Innisville. They say the wheel did cause some serious damage to other vehicles, but thankfully zero injuries were reported. Still, they noted that one of the wheel nuts actually embedded itself into a windshield and it is always wise to retorque those as needed. They say the driver's wheel came off soon after visiting his garage. All right, let's go back to the forecast. Mainly clear skies. Once again, just a few clouds, a light breeze, a nice-looking day, and no rains expected for the next few days. Also a great time to be outside on a patio if that's your plans. 24 degrees this afternoon and then goes up to 25 at 5 o'clock and then a little bit later in the evening, 23 degrees. But the beauty is lots of sunshine, a great day. We'll give you a full recap and also a look at our long-range forecast a little bit later on in the show. Stay with us. Okay, so I was out walking the dog this morning and the grass was still so wet. I think the ground is still really saturated from all of the rain we got uh, earlier this week. But now we have clear skies ahead, sunny uh, forecast. I think that's one of the benefits of all the rain we had last week, Tuesday, and also the heavy rain we had yesterday, that you don't have to water the grass. And that'll be the case for, I guess, a few days. But eventually you're going to have to because lots of sunshine. This was the view this morning downtown as the CN Tower towered above the condo high-rises. Our thanks to CP24 for the great video. 
Now, looking at how things are outside right now, clear skies, just a few clouds here and there. But it's really just a lovely day, great conditions. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy yourself over the next few days as well. As for our satellite radar, you can see there's really nothing much going on. Uh, maybe a few pop-up showers here and there, but as far as the GTHA is concerned, uh, nothing for us to really be concerned about. Right now, we're sitting at 22 degrees in Wyerton, 23 in Toronto, 23 in Windsor, which is about seasonal. And it does get a little bit warmer because of the Humidex. Right now, uh, the highs expected, 25 in Toronto, 23 in Peterborough, 26 in Niagara Falls. It's going to feel a little bit warmer again with the Humidex. Uh, the lows overnight normal, 13 in Peterborough, 16 in Kingston, 16 in Toronto. And as for that long-range forecast, you're going to see lots of sunshine. For today, a mix of sun and cloud, but mainly sunshine. For tomorrow, sunny. The high goes up to 28, and it consistently stays warm for the next few days. Saturday, sunshine, 28. Sunday, lots of sunshine, a high of 30. So the weekend is looking really nice. And then for Monday, there's that chance of showers, but the chance is low. But look at it again, the high 30 degrees. And then for Tuesday and Wednesday's highs of 28 and 29 are expected. So a bit of a warm-up, but pretty dry out there. Okay, thanks, Nathan. Well, 20 Team Canada athletes flew overnight to Paris, headed to the Summer Games. And there was a great send-off at Pearson Airport. CTV's Janice Golding has the story. We did it! Yeah! You're looking at some of Team Canada's top athletes who will be representing our country at the Paris Games. More than 20 young athletes being cheered on by passengers and Air Canada employees as they made their way through Pearson International Airport this evening to board a plane toward their Olympic dreams. It feels amazing. I've been really emotional quite a lot today and it just keeps bringing just a lot of emotion and it's just really special to walk through as a team and to experience it as a team. One of the athletes making his way overseas, Olympic breaker Phil Kim, who won silver at the 2023 World Championships and gold at the Pan Am Games last year. For me, I'm very grateful and just lucky with timing, to be honest. When it was first announced, I wasn't really a contender. Um, and in the last few years, I think I've been lucky to kind of flourish and the timing just kind of worked out for me. And honestly, I'm taking it day by day. I'm not even thinking about it. I mean, we have all of this going on, uh, but I'm just going to Paris right now and then we'll, we'll take it day by day when I get there. Meanwhile, Team Canada has named a pair of gold medalists, weightlifter Maud Charon, and sprinter Andre de Grasse as flag bearers for Friday's Olympic opening ceremony in Paris. I thought they made a mistake. Like, I was not supposed to do the opening ceremony. Um, and now, like, I'm doing it and I'm leading it. It's such a great honor. This is going to be a big memory for me and, you know, for my family to watch this and just to be a part of it. So I'm um, just, I'm just super honored and super excited to really just uh, to do it. The duo will carry the Maple Leaf in what's expected to be a unique parade of nations, not marching into a stadium, but sailing boats down the Seine River in the heart of Paris. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> so a lot of excitement and anticipation from all the young athletes who are Paris-bound. As Janice mentioned, Canadian champions Maud Charon, a weightlifter, and sprinter Andre de Grasse will leave the team tomorrow as flag bearers at the opening ceremony parade. You know, this is going to be a big memory for me and, you know, for my family to watch this and just to be a part of it. I thought they made a mistake. Like, I was not supposed to do the opening ceremony. Um, and now, like, I'm doing it and I'm leading it. It's such a great honor. I don't know enough words in English to express how I feel. Still to come, romance scams are still a problem, taking millions from victims every year. CTV's Pat Foran will have the details. A Markham-based company is now at the center of an international criminal investigation for its alleged role in an elaborate pyramid scheme. It is accused of taking advantage of hundreds of thousands of investors around the world and disappearing with more than $2 billion. CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports. A crime crafted by a Canadian-based company carried out across the world. It's like whack-a-mole. Every time you find one, you close it down, another one pops up. Metaverse Foreign Exchange, also known as MTFE, pitched itself as a reputable trading platform. Federally incorporated in Ontario with a Canadian director, it was even registered with Canada's money laundering watchdog, FinTrack. Now a joint investigation by the Investigative Journalism Foundation and CTV National News reveals that names associated with MTFE are part of a network of dozens of Canadian shell companies believed to be peddling cryptocurrency investment schemes. 
marketed heavily to investors in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Hundreds of thousands of people in those countries invested their money using MTFE's online app. In August 2023, the Canadian company's platform went offline, leaving clients in the dark. An estimate of more than $2 billion vanished. I don't think people expect something like that to happen in a country like Canada. In Bangladesh, one corporate lawyer has been following the money trail. I think the target market for these products are the more vulnerable population. Our investigation into Metaverse Foreign Exchange led us here to this office building in Markham, Ontario, Unit 500 to be exact. Once we began digging even deeper, we found a total of 97 money service businesses that have all used that one suite as their address. So we decided to follow the trail and pay Unit 500 a visit. Hi, how are you? Good. My name's Adrian Gobriel. I'm with CTV National News. Inside, we found a shared office space. A manager whose identity we're protecting alleges that there's a list of criminal companies using this location as their business address. I have 650 legitimate clients here. Okay? Um, 90 percent of them are good, legitimate businesses. There's 10 percent of that group that are not, but we can't keep track of the people that are using it. In Sri Lanka, a criminal investigation has been opened. Court records show three people have been arrested for money laundering and that MTFE's parent company in Canada allegedly pocketed 30 to 40 percent of all service fees. Fintrack has suspended Metaverse's registration, though the director of Canada's Money Service Business Association believes the culprits behind this apparent made-in-Canada scam may have vanished, with far more than the $2 billion being reported. Times that by 10. There's way more than just Metaverse. I guarantee you this group that you've discovered is still operating. So who do we believe is behind Metaverse and how are these criminal companies exploiting Canada's system? We dive into that tomorrow. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Romance scams are the third most common way criminals are fleecing Canadians from their money just after investment and job scams. Victims lost $52 million to romance scams last year and have already lost another $23 million to scammers so far this year. CTV's Pat Foran has the details. I feel like he groomed me for four years. Paige Harkness decided to try online dating four years ago while using a telephone dating site. She connected with a man and they met in person twice. He wore a tailored suit, said he flew by private jet and managed a hedge fund. He almost always was saying he was flying private. And I had no reason to question it because the, the success he said he had and the company he worked for. Harkness says she never saw him again, but several times a year he would send her a text to say hello. Recently, he contacted her to say he had a surefire investment opportunity. She was scammed out of $14,000. going to be $14,000 of my money that I took off on a line of credit against my home. Yes, if I'm single, I said, yes, I'm single. He seemed to be in love with me and he wanted to know more about me. A woman we'll call Rama asked us not to identify her after she was caught in a romance scam. She was on Facebook when she connected with a man who claimed he was the captain of a cruise ship in the UK. He professed his love for her and started sending her gifts of designer purses, watches and jewelry but he claimed it got tied up at the Canadian border and she needed to pay brokerage fees, taxes, insurance, and other costs. She was scammed out of a total of $62,000. Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm so broken. Till now I'm so broken because I take out all my life saving. I even take my line of credit of $54,000. Signs of a romance scam. When someone declares their love for you quickly, they make excuses not to meet in person. You're told not to discuss a relationship with others and you're asked for money for travel or an emergency. Both women say they should have seen the red flag sooner and wanted to share their story to warn others. I feel so stupid because I should have avoided, this could have been avoided. Like, probably I should have gone to the police from the beginning. Pat Foran, CTV News. Canada's women's soccer team has already kicked off their Olympic gold medal defense. They are on the pitch against New Zealand this hour, but the team is under a microscope after an alleged spying scandal came to light. CTV's Beth McDonnell is standing by alongside fans at the sports bar downtown. Beth, what is the mood in the room right now? 
Natalie, this controversy is surrounding the Canada's women's team. The gold medal defending champions as they play their first game against New Zealand at the Paris Games. Right now, the score is tied. New Zealand scored first, followed by Canada. These spying allegations stem from Monday and last Friday. There were reports of drones flying over New Zealand's team practices. Two members of the Canadian team, analyst Joseph Lombardi and assistant coach Jasmine Mander, have been sent home. Head coach Bev Priestman has also removed herself from this open match. A few fans have shown up here at Real Sports downtown to watch the game. Here's their reaction to these allegations. Those are heavy allegations. Obviously, removing the coach is a big deal, uh, especially with the uh, reigning gold medal champions. That's worrisome, but I think the girls will overcome. I was shocked at first to hear, to be honest. Um, you know, but I have heard reports that it does happen a lot. So, you know, although it's, it could be pretty common for teams to do this and spy on each other, um, you know, I think the fact that Canada got caught and, um, you know, they're suffering the consequences is unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, it should have never happened in the first place. I never condone cheating, and I don't understand why two people would use a drone to watch the opposite team. So far, the Canadian Olympic Committee says the IOC does not have a pending investigation. It says New Zealand's football club has made a complaint to FIFA and they're asking that if Canada wins this match today in Paris, that no points go towards that that they won. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Natalie, back to you. Okay, thank you, Beth. Still to come, it has been another tough day of the stock market, including for some tech stocks. We'll have the details in business. What channel? Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. Some big U.S. tech stocks fell again in morning trading. Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Here are your business headlines. U.S. stock indices edged up today, but there were more declines in some prominent tech giants. Microsoft was down 1%, and Meta Platform slipped half a percent. That's after a brutal sell-off the previous day that saw the Nasdaq Composite Index slide more than 3%. Toronto stocks dipped, dragged down by gold miners as bullion prices weakened. Shares in Ford plunged 16% after warranty expenses ate into profits in the company's latest quarter. Adjusted earnings were 47 cents a share, far short of the Wall Street expectation of about 68 cents. Morgan Stanley griped that, quote, high warranty costs were already a problem. They just keep getting worse. And finally, Loblaw and its parent company, George Weston, have settled class action lawsuits related to bread price fixing between 2001 and 2015. The total settlement is $500 million Canadian, including $96 million previously paid to customers by Loblaw under a card program. Other food retailers have been accused by the Competition Bureau of taking part in the scheme. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. Yesterday's interest rate cut by the Bank of Canada is said to have significant impacts on anyone with debt. CTV's Raheem Ladani has more on how the dip is affecting people in this city, including a man whose mortgage is up for renewal. For homeowners like Kevin, today's announcement from the Bank of Canada is perfect timing. I don't got to get a mortgage until next month, so... We'll see. And hopefully get a better rate than what I was, uh, what I prequaled at. For the second time in as many months, the BOC has lowered its key interest rate by 25 basis points, meaning more breathing room. Now with the interest rates coming down 50 basis points, it's, it's a little bit more comforting. You know, you can, I think a lot more people can stomach it a little bit. It's been over a year since the rate was this low in Canada, although it is not expected to be enough of a drop to spur much activity in the housing market. There's no way I could afford to live in the city except renting. A small condo, like now it's almost a one million here in this area, that's too much. 
Outside of housing, the rate cut also means the cost of borrowing money is cheaper, so you're able to keep more of it. You're going to notice that your interest on your line of credit will fall, but you still have your line of credit that you have to contend with. So if you run up that amount, uh, this is not going to bring relief to that, just to the interest component. And same thing for credit card debt as well. With inflation now at 2.7 percent and within the Bank of Canada's target range, there are other areas of the economy also seeing an impact. Grocery inflation has come down. Gas prices have moderated. A lot of that has to do with interest rate hikes in the past. And all of those together, I think, moving forward, uh, will be gradually coming lower. With labor markets falling and excess supply, there may be more rate cuts in 2024. Although the Bank of Canada will need to be delicate not to weaken the economy too much. Raheem Ladani, CTV News. We're turning now to news south of the border. U.S. President Joe Biden delivered an address from the Oval Office last night to explain his departure from the presidential race. Now, for more on the impact of his speech, we're joined now by strategist Hin Zayan, the founder and CEO of Generation Politique, a group aimed at mobilizing young people in the election process. Hin, thanks for joining us. So what's been the reaction in France and European countries to Biden's speech last night? Well, I think a lot of people believe that Last night's speech was a very dignified speech. You know, you've heard a lot of governments and a lot of heads of state say that it was very brave that what uh, Joe Biden did, President Biden did, was very brave. So here, the reaction is, we thought that it was a, a very dignified speech. It was uh, just uh, short enough, but also long enough to state what he thought about the entire process and to explain to the American people, but also to the world, what happened. And we could also feel it was very emotional. It was both a man who was talking about his own path towards that decision, which was a tough decision because he believed he could stay and he could win. But also it was a moment where he faced history, where he said to the American people, but also to the world and to Europe, that he was there to defend democracy, just like Benjamin Franklin and other presidents before him did. Of a Kamala Harris presidency, the prospect of that, what's been the reaction there? Oh, that's a good question, because honestly, here people don't know much about her. But I have to say, in a lot of the talks that I've had this for, with people in France, but also from other European countries, they're pretty, pretty reassured. They kind of think uh, she could win against Donald Trump. You know, ever since Donald Trump, uh, former President Donald Trump made those comments about NATO a couple of months ago, a lot of people People have been scared here in Europe and have been thinking, what are we going to do if we have a Donald Trump presidency? So people are kind of relieved to see a new face on the Democratic side. But here again, people don't know much about her. And I think it's going to be a big challenge for her and her campaign to say who she is to America, but also to the world and also what she's going to do. What are her plans for the future for the country, for the United States, but also for the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. And the opening ceremony in Paris as we pivot to the Olympics just a day away. How are things looking there now? So security is extremely tight here. It's very difficult to get around. The atmosphere is a bit, uh, you know, people are not always so happy because of the security that is so tight, you know, it's uh, not very convenient if, what, if you want to go to work. A lot of uh, small shop owners are unhappy because, you know, we have those big fences, like I said, ex extremely hard to get around, those big fences. So if you want to go to a shop or if you want to go at a restaurant, at a terrace, for example, and Paris is very famous for its terraces, it's very hard. You need a QR code. So a lot of uh, small shop owners small restaurant owners are not happy about it because the security is so tight and because they have less client clients than they, they used to have at this time of the year. However, we are kind of relieved at the same time and people are relieved because we know that the government understands so the assignment and the security is extremely extre taken extremely seriously here. What we think is going to happen, because we have the big opening ceremony tomorrow night, is that after the opening ceremony, everybody's going to be able to breathe a little bit more smoothly. And also, we're going to be able to see more people coming out. So we're not at a phase where people are enjoying the show. People are enjoying the atmosphere, because we're still very, very focused on that very first night, which is extremely important. But we believe, and I believe too, that 
starting from tomorrow night, people are going to be a little bit more joyful and we're going to be able also to enjoy the event. I'm sure there's going to be a sigh of relief. Political strategist Hin Zayan, thank you. Thank you. With weather news now, Canada Post has unveiled a stamp honoring the late Norman Jewison. CTV's Andrea Case has more on the honor for the Toronto-born director. Doing the honors of revealing Canada Post's newest commemorative stamp celebrating the life and legacy of Norman Jewison, his widow, Lynn St. David Jewison, and Canada Post Doug Edinger. He told compelling stories with great, the shaping of great stories, so that people would think about things differently, maybe even act differently, which was wonderful. The acclaimed Toronto-born filmmaker died earlier this year. Film critic Richard Krause calls Jewison his mentor and friend. His legacy is the way that he helped people. He helped me early on in my career by giving me the confidence uh, to be a film critic. He got in touch with me. He reached out and said, I like what you do. And others, world famous filmmakers, weren't doing that. And so that meant a huge amount to me. And we've stayed in touch for all the years since then. The photo picked by Jewison before he died was taken in the screening room of the Canadian Film Centre by Peter Bregg in 2007. After the picture was published in Hello Magazine, he called me and says, could I have that picture? Yeah, of course, because I always give my pictures to the subjects whenever I can. And uh, he says, do you mind if I use it? I said, no, I'd be thrilled if you used it. It's fitting that Jewison should end up on a stamp because he was an avid stamp collector. He was even sworn in as a postmaster in his father's store when he was a young man. Maxine Bailey now runs the CFC, which Jewison founded three decades ago. Its programs trains the next generation of filmmakers. Funny, smart, intelligent, creative, passionate. Oh, my God, he had the best laugh and giggle. And he believed that Canadians could actually run the creative industries. And he wanted to bring, make sure that we were training the best of the best, and that's what we do here. The permanent domestic Norman Jewison stamp is now available. Andrea Case, CTV News. Coming up, a kickoff for the Caribbean Carnival with Toronto Police. The celebration is on. That's after the break. A well-known public art display that adorned a square for more than half a century in Atlantic Canada is being brought back to life. CTV Sarah Plowman caught up with the people working to restore it. Sprayed with steam. Brushed with tiny touches. Delicate work on a more than 1,300 kilogram limestone sculpture of two beavers that for more than 60 years sat in the heart of Fredericton. There was a lot of, of just weather damage in particular and a lot of lichen. Cracks discovered prompted the city to move the beavers into storage at the start of a revitalization project eight years ago. The goal is to display them again indoors. Carved by Acadian artist Claude Roussel, this was once an 80th birthday gift to Lord Beaverbrook. The New Brunswick-born businessman who served in Winston Churchill's war cabinet and built Fredericton's Beaverbrook Art Gallery. I think many people that grew up in Fredericton and also those who visited Fredericton over the years have seen them, uh, had their photo taken with them, climbed on top of them. The beavers are being cleaned, picked, scrubbed and massaged. The sculpture is art and so is restoring it. When I clean something, it gets cleaned and repaired and whatever else, and then everybody just all of a sudden notices the object and not that I've been there. Once this job is done, its next stop is the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. Literally be the first thing you see as you walk in the Beaverbrook Art Gallery through the main doors. So once again, people can appreciate the sculpture and the story that shaped it. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. The countdown is on and ahead of one of the biggest events on the city's cultural calendar, the Toronto Caribbean Carnival. Toronto police held their annual kickoff celebration today.
The event began with a pan rendition of O Canada performed by Love Sound. The theme of this year's celebration is It Takes a Village. Toronto Police Chief Myron Demkew said he was pleased to relocate the annual event from police headquarters to the Eastview Neighbourhood Community Centre to combine with other local festivities today. As some of you know, every year since 1991, the Toronto Police Service has hosted a Caribbean Carnival event to celebrate the cultural heritage and diversity of the people from the Caribbean, the many islands of the Caribbean, and the spirit that they contribute to the rich fabric of Canadian culture. The event also featured a performance from the Muendo Dance Group and was followed up by a children's parade. There are several other celebrations taking place ahead of the Grand Parade on Saturday, August 3rd. Yeah, next weekend, cannot wait. And that is CTV News at noon. Remember, you can get Toronto's breaking news all day long on CP24 and at our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. For all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching. I'm Natalie Johnson. And I'm Nathan Dowd. And be sure to join us later at CTV News at 5 and 6.